There it is. Thank you. I'm Rafael Fernandez. I'm Slava Cherniak. Uh, we work in Cloud Dataflow, and we're very excited to be here today and tell you a little bit more <clears throat> about what happened in one of the, de the demos that you saw this morning uh, in the keynote in particular, the taxi data demo. So we're going to take a closer look at that one. We're going to focus on the continuous event processing aspect of that demo uh, using Cloud Dataflow. We're going to take a closer look at how you, as a GCP developer, can compose various services that we have on the platform so that you can enable all the various complementary data processing patterns uh, that modern applications require. We will also spend some time highlighting a very powerful feature in the Cloud Dataflow service, which allows you to update your continuous computations in real time. The services that we're going to be talking about today uh, are Cloud PubSub, Cloud Dataflow, and BigQuery. They are all fully managed. They're all scalable. They do different things. Cloud PubSub is our PubSub publish and subscribe service. It's global. It guarantees at least once delivery. Cloud Dataflow is our fully managed data processing service that will allow you to run programs that evaluate your data either in batch or streaming mode. It comes with a very powerful programming model, which is the result of years of focusing on the developer experience at Google. So we think you're going to like it. And th what this programming model does is it allows you to stay at a higher level of abstraction describing your data transformations instead of going down to the distributed systems level uh, and all those intricacies. Uh, last, BigQuery is our fully managed petabyte scale, low-cost data warehouse uh, for analytics. It's a favorite uh, for data analysts. So what we want to do here is we want to use a live stream of telemetry data that is coming uh, from taxis in the New York City area. And we want to build a series of data paths for this data. We're going to process it, and we're going to power different experiences. One of those experiences could be a live visualization of this data as it is occurring on the New York uh, metro area. As you can imagine, uh, we're going to be relying on Cloud PubSub to deliver these messages, and it probably wouldn't be a wise choice to build this application directly in the client. It wouldn't be a bad choice because your client, if you have a single machine that's in charge of displaying this data and doing all these computations, you're going to end up with an experience that looks a lot like this, basically an ever-growing queue of undelivered messages. That's probably not what you want in a lively uh, map or in a lively display. You will continue to process this data, but the results that you're giving are not lively. You're actually falling behind. So this suggests that we need, for this portion of our processing, a different strategy. There are also likely to be other requirements in addition to liveliness, because you're dealing with data that, at the end of the day, results in money. So correctness, completeness, Reliability, scalability, and performance are kind of built in when you process your, your data here. We need to honor those. We also have this requirement of liveliness, which suggests continuous event processing. And another thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be archiving the data as it comes along with some transformations for further use. Since we have systems that allow us to store data uh, at a very good uh, economical rate, we can just be archiving everything we see for analysts to later study and mine and, and derive some more insights in addition to the ones that you're doing live. Another thing that's common in this uh, type of activities is being mindful of, of your application lifecycle management. How do you coordinate updates? How do you patch things? So we're going to be talking a little bit about that as well. Uh, let's start with one concrete example. Let's count rights. So Slava, take it away. Thanks, Rafael. So let's talk about what we would like to do with our taxi data. Our taxi telemetry is arriving, and we already said that we'd like to condense it into something that we can process on a single machine in our visualizer. We would like to use Dataflow to write a pipeline to do this for us. Uh, it takes t uh, that would take raw taxi telemetry and transform it into something condensed in time and space. But we'd like to do this in a way that preserves enough information for our visualization to still be accurate. Uh, we're going to step through and talk about how we do this. 
So the raw taxi, taxi telemetry data would look something like this. You know, we have latitude and longitude points. Uh, we have timestamps about the most recent location of a taxi, and we'll have some other additional metadata, such as you know how, how many people are in the taxi or what the current taxi meter reading is. So how do we go about uh, condensing this data in time and space? Well, first, we're going to window the data in time. What I mean by this is that we're going to group together all points that occurred uh, sufficiently close to each other in time. So all points for the interval you know, 1 to 2, that's uh, uh, three points here, get grouped together. And all the points that occurred in the interval from 2 to 3, that's one point here, get grouped together. The next thing we'd like to do is group the points together in space. Again. What we do here is we assign groupings based on uh, the location. So x, y points within a window get grouped together. That's two points. k, m points within a window uh, get grouped together. That's one point for the 1 to 2 window and one point for the uh, 2 to 3 window. Finally, what we do is we count up the points in each such uh, time and space grouping, and we're ready to emit the results. That's two taxis for our x and y in the 1 to 2 interval, one taxi for km in the 1 to 2 interval, and one taxi for km in the 2 to 3 interval. So what have we actually accomplished here? Well, we've described a set of logical transformations that take us from our input data our raw taxi telemetry, and give us something that is much condensed in terms of the volume of the stream, but still carries sufficient information to be correct for our visualization. OK, how do we take this logical description and actually turn this into data flow code? Well, we do it like this. Notice that every line of code here corresponds exactly to a logical transformation that we described over our data. We've encoded the set of transformations that move us from the raw taxi telemetry into a condensed volume result stream. Also important, this is real data flow code. And notably absent from this code are things like setting up clusters, spinning up virtual machines, deploying resources, recovering from crashes or faults. All of these things are being handled for you by data flow. So what are data flow programs? Data flow programs describe logical transformations over collections of data. These collections are called p-collections and may be bounded or unbounded in the case of data streams. The transformations are called p-transforms, and they may, may be executed over these uh, p-collections to produce new p-collections. Together, these allow us to build up a pipeline which describes how our data is transformed from the input to the desired result. So look at this pipeline. We start with a p-collection, which we read in from PubSub. And this is an unbounded p-collection, which means that data is continuing to arrive forever. We then apply a sequence of p-transforms to it, creating new collections, p-collections at every point. And the resulting p-collection is written back out to PubSub. The pipeline continues to run forever until it is stopped, because this output p-collection is also unbounded. There we go. So we use transforms such as windowing, mapping, and count here. These are built into the uh, Dataflow SDK, and you have to do no additional work to use these other than just invoking them in your code. Other transforms, such as uh, combined writes or uh, uh, yeah, condensed writes here, can be written by you. So I'm going to show this condensed write transform here, which you wrote and then applied in parallel over the data, which basically what it does is it just groups together points that occurred within 100 meters of each other. And so this is being run in parallel over your data in a streaming fashion here. So once we have written our pipeline, what do we do with it? Well, we can run it on Google Cloud Dataflow. Uh, and we tell it some basic things like where to read the input, where to write the output, some in parameters like the initial number of workers we want it to use. And then we run it. And what's happening when, the, uh, when we actually run it? Well, lots of things are being taken care of by the back end for us. Uh, it's optimizing the execution graph so that the execution happens more efficiently. It's spinning up VMs. It's staging pipeline code to those VMs. It's managing I.O. with PubSub. Uh, it's managing persistent state for fault tolerance. And by the way, let's talk about fault tolerance. Uh, if the VM happened to crash or any other kind of fault happens, the uh, Dataflow Execution Engine will transparently restart things for you and continue to work. And no data will be lost because of the checkpointing of persistent state about the, about the pipeline execution. So, Data flow guarantees are always preserved, even in the case of machine crashes, exceptions, anything else. So once this pipeline is run, here's what it looks like. Um, 
This is just a snapshot of the UI. Uh, Andrea did a talk earlier today where she went uh, very much in depth on the UI. Um, but this is just a snapshot of what this looks like. This is, gives you a little bit more information about uh, the pipeline. It tells you about the pipeline as a whole. It tells you about the steps. It tells you how many workers are processing, uh, how, many, um, how many messages are being consumed by each, uh, by each step in the pipeline. And by the way, if you notice, this pipeline looks a lot like the logical diagram that we drew earlier. So your pipeline-centric view about the transformations that you're performing in your data is maintained in this UI. So I want to call your attention to one thing here specifically, which is that if you can read that over there, the uh, volume of the stream fell from about 20,000 messages per second. After we condensed in time and space, it fell to about 2,000 messages per second, a tenfold reduction, which is the desired outcome. So now we can point our visualizer at this, and we see the same results, but now we can keep up. We know we can keep up. Because when we, point, when we look at the pub sub subscription statistics in uh, Stackdriver, we see that our backlog is not growing. If you notice, there's a, an initial spike here. This is when the data flow was spinning up. While the workers were coming up, we were building some backlog. And then when the workers spun up and started uh, processing, they churned through that backlog and then continued to keep up ever since. So this is one example of a data flow program in action. I want to talk about a particular, a couple of particular aspects of the data flow programming API that make it interesting. Specifically, I want to talk about how do we deal in data flow with unbounded data. Our taxi ride data has no bound. Events continue to come in forever. So in general, as data gets larger, we may want to break it up into smaller chunks for processing. If we're using a traditional batch system, we might do something like daily windows. But really, this is just a cheap way of dealing with data uh, that is unbounded. So one of the difficulties of unbounded data is that there may be unknown delays, and data may show up out of order. Look at this record here. There's a few records here that all happened at 8 o'clock. One occurred and was delivered to us right away in the stream. One occurred and was delivered to us a little bit later. But this green record that occurred at 8 o'clock here didn't show up in our stream until six hours later. And who knows why that could be? That could be for a multitude of reasons. Maybe a user had an event occur on their phone, and they put their phone in airplane mode and didn't turn it back on uh, for six hours. Maybe a server crashed and didn't come back online for six hours. Maybe there was a network delay. You know, an uh, undersea cable got cut somewhere. Who knows? The point is that if we're writing a stream processing system, we need to be able to deal with such delays. And depending on what you're doing, the strategy for dealing with these delays is also different. If you're doing some sort of element-wise transformation, element transformation, maybe you don't care. If you're processing an element at a time and you don't care about the, when that element occurred or the context of that element, this is probably fine. But things get a lot trickier if you're doing uh, some sort of grouping or aggregation. So one obvious strategy is to use processing time windows. So you slice up your stream in processing time, and what do I mean by that? Let's say every time um, a clock ticks over by an hour, you draw a boundary in your stream and you process what you have. Well, this is easy to understand, sure, but this probably doesn't give you what you want. If elements are delayed or out of order, they're probably not going to wind up in the same processing time buckets. So for example, our two messages that both happened at 8 o'clock, if your aggregation group involves grouping them together or do reasoning about them uh, when they occurred together, you're going to have a hard time with that, uh, since they're going to be now in two different processing time windows. So for example, if you're trying to count taxis that showed up in the same place around the same time, processing time windows are probably not what you want. What we'd really like to have is an event time windowing strategy. As input is arriving, we want to perform a time-based shuffle to place the records into windows based on their event times. The way to do this in Dataflow is with the windowing API. And so what windowing allows you to do is it window, windowing allows you to divide events into windows based on event time so that you can reason about them in, a, in the correct context. So Dataflow supports many kinds of windows. A couple of examples, although by no means an exhaustive list, is something like fixed windows, the simplest type. These are windows that can be every minute, every hour, every day, and so on. Um, and these, these windows are typically the same across all processing keys. Another example that's similar is sliding windows. These are similar to fixed windows, but made up of smaller panes, which allow them to slide with time moving forward. Um, an interesting thing here is that the windows actually wind up overlapping. Um, another interesting example is something like session windows. Uh, so sessions are uh, 
are events of uh, activity surrounded by periods of inactivity. And so an interesting thing about sessions is that the boundaries of a session window are functions on, are functions on the data itself. They're not knowable a priori. So they must be computed as you're processing on your data and will depend completely on the data and very differently from key to key. So this is not something that is uh, possible or easy to do uh, with a traditional batch system, but it is easy to do with data flow. Other windows are, of course, possible and are a matter of um, implementation and whatever the requirements of your application are. So windows let us answer the question of where in event time we would like to perform our aggregation we still need to answer a different question, which is when in processing time we are ready to emit our results. In order to do that, we first need to better define the relationship between event time and processing time. So let's look at this graph here. Uh, on the horizontal axis, we have event time, and on the vertical axis, we have processing time. And every event that happens, will, uh, that is delivered to our system and processed by our system, is going to wind up somewhere on this graph. In an ideal world, where events are delivered to us instantaneously and processed instantaneously, every event would line up across, uh, along this ideal diagonal. So it would be delivered and processed at the same event time, uh, we process the same processing time as the event time of its occurrence. Of course, reality is not so nice. Um, you know, there's network delays, processing is not instantaneous. So in fact, all of our events wind up somewhere above this ideal diagonal. Dataflow provides something called the watermark, which helps us reason about completeness. The watermark tells us how far above this diagonal we can draw a line beyond which we don't expect to see any more events. This watermark is represented as a red line on this graph. If we know everything about our sources perfectly, so if we're reading from a source that we know everything in perfectly and completely about, the watermark is a hard guarantee that in our system we'll never see anything beyond this delay. Of course, in many cases, our knowledge is imperfect, and so the watermark is also an imperfect uh, guarantee. It's really a heuristic that tells us, as far, to the best of the system's knowledge, when do we not expect to see any new data. Either way, the watermark can tell us when we expect to have all the data for the uh, given window, and therefore when it is correct, as far as we know, to the best of our knowledge, to emit the results. So if we look at the, again at, the windowing, uh, at windowing as a time-based shuffle, uh, we can see how wa the watermark helps us know when to emit uh, the results of a window. However, the watermark may not be everything that you want to use for triggering output. There are two major reasons uh, why you might want to consider something else. First of all, the watermark may be too slow, so to speak. The watermark is trying to be as conservative as possible. It's trying to keep track of every event in the system, which is great from the st standpoint of completeness but maybe you don't care. If you're doing daily windows, for example, you're not going to get your output until the end of the day, at the very earliest. But you might want some speculative early results earlier. So the Dataflow Triggers API allows you to trigger early speculative output. The watermark may also be too fast. We already said that if we don't know everything about our sources, meaning our source can produce late or out of order data, the watermark may be imperfect. And so an event might come in even after the watermark has already advanced. In this case, Dataflow provides late data triggers that allow you to handle uh, late data when it occurs in order to emit updates to your results. So let's look at building this example up a little bit. Here we have um, windows, two-minute two windows, event time windows, that are being closed by the watermark. So what we're doing in these windows is we're uh, building a um, running total. As processing time moves forward, represented as up in this graph, we know when we can close the window when the watermark passes the window boundary. Notice, though, that there is one event here that's not included in any window, that event with a value of 9, and that's because it was late data. As I described, it was an event that was emitted by a source after the watermark already advanced because we didn't know per something perfectly about the source. So maybe it was uh, you know, an event that came in from somebody's phone that was in airplane mode for six hours. And so the late data trigger uh, API in Dataflow allows you to handle that and then emit some sort of updated aggregation. So let's put all of this together now and use it to try and answer a few questions about our taxi data that we saw earlier. Uh, let's start with a simple question. At a given point in time, how do the taxi rides from airports compare to uh, overall taxi rides across New York? And we're going to try and use everything we learned about Dataflow to, uh, to answer that question. So 
the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to write a pipeline that uh, what it does here is it filters out the, uh, the rides that originated at airports. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, we read things in from PubSub as before. Let's try that again. Uh, the next thing that we do is we associate the ride ID with each, uh, with each ride. So the ride ID tells us which ride this taxi ride point is associated with so that we can group together all the points that are coming in from a single ride. All right, then. Next, we use session windows uh, to draw window boundaries around the ride. So we uh, draw window boundaries uh, at the beginning of the ride, that's the pickup point, and 10 minutes after uh, the drop-off point, which is the last point in the ride. The next step in this pipeline is triggering. And triggering controls how results are delivered to the, next, to the subsequent transforms. Here, we trigger continuously on every element so that we ensure that we emit constant updates to the visualizer. We'd like to see the rides moving along in the visualizer, so we'd like to see updates, so we want to make sure to trigger continuously. And here we also use accumulating triggers as opposed to discarding triggers to ensure that we receive full contents of our window on every trigger firing. We then combine all of the points in the window on each trigger firing. So we only care, in our combiner, we only care about two things. We care about the start point, because we're going to need the start point in order to filter out the rides that started at an airport. And we need the most recent point so that we can emit that to the visualization. The accumulate points combine function implements this by keeping track of the start point and then updating the most recent point with a newer one if it becomes available. Then we filter by discarding accumulated rides where the pickup was not at an airport. And we do this by comparing the latitude and longitude of the pickup with well-known set of latitude and longitude, latitude and longitude points for uh, airports, JFK, LaGuardia, and Newark. Since what we actually care about is uh, at the output is only the most recent point, we use a stage to filter just the most recent point from our accumulator. Finally, we write the results back out to PubSub. So when we run this, what does that look like? So we can see that uh, the rides visible, visible in the visualizer are only ones that are starting at JFK, LaGuardia, and Newark, as desired, and that the results are still being updated in real time, which is due to our triggering condition and our care carefully constructed accumulator. So the pipeline we wrote uh, to filter airport rides is only part of our solution, however. Uh, Dataflow and JCP make it easy to compose multiple independent components. So we've, so far, we've talked about taking the taxi data, ingesting it via PubSub, and pointing our visualizer at it. However, we want to do more with this data. Uh, so what we do is we actually put the results back into PubSub, and uh, then we uh, read them through an ETL pipeline that I wrote separately that takes those results from PubSub and then writes them to BigQuery. Uh, this is a very standard use of data flow. And now we can actually use that same ETL pipeline that writes to BigQuery and point it at the raw taxi feed to write the raw uh, data into a separate, BigQuery, a separate set of BigQuery tables so we can compare the BigQuery results for the raw data versus the airport data. So what can we learn? Uh, a simple query against the raw data tells us that in a five-minute interval of time in New York City, there's about 1,700 taxi rides uh, that drop off somewhere in the New York greater area. The average cost of a ride is about 14 bucks, and the average net revenue for the taxi company is about uh, $25,000 for that five-minute interval. How does that compare, for the same five-minute interval, how does that compare with the airport data? Well, when we point the same query at the airport table, what we see is that uh, the number of rides is obviously much smaller, but the average, uh, it's only like 63 rides, I think, but the average cost of the ride is much, much higher, as you would expect, uh, which is about $52 per ride. There is also a time-based component to this data as well. If we graph this data over time, we can see that there's, an, first of all, an obvious daily uh, trend based on you know, time of day in terms of the overall rides and the taxi rides, but also there's some interesting event happening around uh, just before 9 o'clock here in airport rides. Maybe there's a, a bunch of big flights that landed or something. So you can see how you can use this 
strategy and these sort of tools to dive deeper into your data. So the next thing that I would like to do is I would like to uh, talk about another cool feature of Dataflow Service. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to deploy new code to a running Dataflow pipeline live. And we're going to do this while keeping all existing state and aggregations for the running pipeline while adding new functionality. So the, the code that we're going to update is we're going to update the uh, air airport code that I was showing you before. We're going to update it from just picking up um, at uh, just uh, looking for rides that pick up at JFK to also looking for rides that pick up at LaGuardia and Newark. So first of all, let's see what it looks like right now before we update it. So before we update it, um, we see that we have a ton of rides coming out of JFK, but not really so much stuff going on anywhere else. See, there's some rides scattered elsewhere, but really the traffic is coming from JFK. So what we're going to do here is we are going to uh, comment back in the code that tracks LaGuardia and Newark. We're going to hit run here, um, and we're going to tell this pipeline that it needs to update. And that's all I need to do. Because the pipeline is named, it knows how to find the old running pipeline and update it with the new code. So the update is now running, and that's going to take a couple of minutes. And uh, let me actually tab over to the UI here and show you the uh, the pipeline will eventually here go from a state of running into a state of updating. That's going to take a couple of minutes. So let's take a look if it's already updating. Still staging. So it's going to start updating here any second. Well, while it's starting to update, Rafael is going to talk to us about, oh, here it goes. So it's starting to update. That's going to take a, just a couple of minutes here, and Rafael is going to tell us about update in the meantime. Back to the presenter, please. So Slava, <coughs> can you hear me? You can't hear me. No. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Good. OK. So. What Slava is, uh, has done right now, he has initiated a live update of the pipeline that is computing our timed aggregates at a data stream. As you can see, he changed his Java code and he's deploying this change. So notice how this is one piece of our entire strategy that we've put together here on GCP. There is, of course, a direct approach that, that you could take to update this piece of code, which is bring that pipeline down write a new one, and resubmit. That is probably not uh, the best we can do. In fact, Dataflow can do better. What would happen in that use case uh, if you just simply bring it down and up, first of all, Cloud pops up, will continue receiving events from all the taxis. All those events are going to accumulate. You're going to have some work to catch up with once your new pipeline restarts. But more importantly, you will have lost state that was in flight uh, while we were uh, running the original pipeline. So why would you even want to do this? Why, why, why do you want to update? There's many reasons. Adding functionality is one of them. But another very common scenario and concern is what happens when the libraries that you depend on need to be versioned up for security reasons, right? What happens when you need to alter parameters or perhaps uh, change the, the, the type of machine that's backing up your pipelines, et cetera. So these types of changes are things that we want to do with minimal interruption to the service uh, and preserving your intermediate state. So state is really hard here. And what do I mean by state? One of the things that Dataflow, hey, it started working. One of the things that Dataflow is doing uh, in order to guarantee this low latency delivery of results is computing things in an incremental fashion. So if you focus, for example, in this count accumulator near the end, it really has state about the window and the group uh, that it's seeing and the count so far. When the watermark advances, this particular step, the system informs this particular step that it is now correct to emit a result. So the fact that you've been computing this incrementally is what allows you to emit it right away. Okay? So you're not going to have to recompute pieces of the input 
uh, when the time passes. So this intermediate step is state is really important to us. What later flow is going to do is it's basically going to take care of that state and move it to your new pipeline. This example probably seems trivial to you, right? The pipeline looks the same. Uh, the state kind of maps one on one, but there are other things that the service can do for you too, because there are other changes that we consider update compatible. Examples of update compatible changes that you may want to enact on your pipeline include adding another transform and a, perhaps a completely new uh, output path that is perfectly legal, that is perfectly safe, safe to update. Another thing you may want to do is rearrange the steps uh, in your pipeline. Perhaps you, because of the characteristics of your data and the characteristics of your code, through experimentation you discover that rearranging these steps results in a semantically equivalent pipeline that happens to perform uh, much faster. Right? In some cases that, that occurs. The order in which you apply things uh, matter. Other things you may want to do is remove steps. Right? Like the step that we just added, we just remove it. I put a little star there because there is also a class of updates that are unsafe to perform. These updates usually involve transforms that are producing or consuming side inputs. That is, they are away from the main uh, flow. They may be using keyed state, uh, uh, or they may have some operations that involve window merging. Not to worry, if you request such a change, the data flow service will reject uh, the update, but it will not alter the flow of your original pipeline. So there are other things that Dataflow is doing here for you. Once a new job that was updated uh, from a previous job is spun up, we actually show you the provenance of which job uh, came from and so on. So this is a lot of work that's being done on your behalf, so you don't have to worry about all these considerations. And you can actually maintain your code even when it's powering a continuous computation. So, Slava, what's going on with our update? Let's take a look. Demo machine, please. Great. So we can see that the pipeline has been updated. Uh, we can uh, see right here that this is a, uh, the same job name running, and it says that it's updated from the previous job. And when we look at our visualizer now, we can see that there is a bunch of new rides that are coming from LaGuardia now, which is what we would expect after having updated, uh, uh, updated our pipeline. A couple of interesting things to point out in this visualization, however, is the fact that, first of all, our rides from JFK are still all there. We're not just getting new rides from JFK. We still have all of our old rides from JFK. This is what Raphael was talking about. We're preserving the previous pipeline state. Another interesting thing to, po to point out is that we actually also have new and old rides from LaGuardia, not just new rides from LaGuardia. And this is because the LaGuardia rides were in the pipeline already. We just changed the code that was filtering them out at the end. All of that data was already in the windows and in the state and being accumulated. We just changed what we were emitting at the end of the pipeline. So by updating our pipeline, we started emitting the full rides that started at LaGuardia even before the update ran. So this is an interesting thing about keeping the pipeline state that uh, really helps you uh, do the right thing in the case of your, um, of your pipeline. Back to, uh, back to slides, please. Thanks, Lava. Not shown here is a ton of work that's happening behind the scenes. There are things that the service, uh, the data flow can do for you, such as automatically increase or decrease the size of the worker pool uh, to better cope with incoming data, spikes and lulls, because we also scale down. We save you money. That's a good thing. Uh, pops up, not shown here, but this is, this is a global publish subscribe service. It is scalable for you. It, it, it will give you get very interesting guarantees so that you can build this type of, uh, of system with, with correctness and reliability in mind. And BigQuery, the analyst's favorite, completely managed for you. You have no idea how many machines are doing what or when, and you shouldn't have to. You're just writing queries. This is a, a really powerful thing to keep in mind when you develop on GCP. You can use Dataflow to really think about the rest of the services of the platform as either a source on a sink you can really be transforming data as it arrives for different purposes, 
either for continuous delivery of results or for archival or for further transformation, and really leverage the very different services that we have to enable the, very, the various patterns that modern applications require. So in summary, we just took a closer look at some of the technologies that power one of the demos that you saw this morning. Uh, we took a deep dive on how continuous event processing looks like on GCP, in particular with Dataflow. You saw a hint of the programming model. Uh, we think you'll prefer programming at that level instead of programming at the machine level. Uh, and we're also emphasizing these best practices of composition and really thinking about how to treat GCP as a platform that it is so that you can light up different things uh, in a single flow. And of course, uh, with streaming update, you can now take care of really complicated lively applications with, min with minimal downtime and no data loss, which we think is very important. So last, I wanted to talk about Apache Beam. So in early 2016, we announced our intention to move the Dataflow programming model and the SDKs, Java and Python, uh, that we have right now, to the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, I am very happy to share with you that Apache Beam is now a top-level project in the Apache Software Foundation. This is, again, the result of us paying attention to developer productivity at Google, developing a new model that we now want to have a community of people using uh, in a variety of services. So what's next uh, for you? If you're interested, there are a couple of talks tomorrow about Apache Beam. The first talk is really centered about the community aspect and ecosystem uh, now that Apache Beam is a top-level uh, uh, project in the, in the Apache Software Foundation. You will also find out how we're going to move from the Dataflow SDK uh, to Beam and what's the story around that. The second talk goes a little deeper, talks about portable and parallel data processing using Apache Beam and what this portability means now that uh, this model is really available for the community. We have resources for you as well. A couple of URLs there for you to find more. There's also a code lab right here. Uh, if you want to try Dataflow, if you haven't had a chance, you can actually write a program uh, here at the conference. There's another code lab that utilizes this taxi data which is now available to you as a public data stream. So you can play with it. You can learn how to develop uh, this type of applications. And you can access that code lab at codelabs.developer.google.com. So I want to thank you very much for coming, and we're happy to take your questions. Um. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, first question is, uh, um, let's say I do a not very smart uh, grouping and I have a lot of stuff in one group um, and now I run out of memory in one instance. Uh, what will happen mm -hmm. then? Um, so there's, there's a couple of answers to that question. Um, first of all, um, at the application level, you can all, so what you're talking about is uh, we don't also call the problem of hot keys. Um, there's a, a couple of different way, ways of handling it. One is at the application level, you can always find a better sharding strategy, a better keying strategy so that you don't have those hotkeys. There's also multi-level combines in Dataflow that allow you to essentially do fanon to reduce the volume to a single key. So it's... It is something that you, ha you as a developer have to be a little bit aware of. It's not something that can be completely transparently handled by Dataflow. Because you know, if, you, if you throw all of your traffic against one key, at some point there's nothing we can do. But um, as long as you, you are aware that that is something that is happening, there are tools within Dataflow that make it easy to handle it. Yeah. So the, the, the high order bit for you to keep here is the finding a rekeying strategy, even mid pipeline, is, is a very good way to guard against these, these very hot keys or very hot groups. Um, yeah. Okay. And I had a second question. Uh, you mentioned basically these updates that are not compatible mm -hmm. um, with your current uh, system. How would you then run this update? So basically, how do I replace a uh, running right. system? Right. So there are several strategies. In, in some cases, what people do is they suspend flow. They, they know that there is a computable set in the case of temporal windows of which windows are going to be considered dirty because you will have lost... Uh, this data, so they are prepared to enact some data loss because the upgrade, it's the equivalent of, of a breaking change. And they are OK in some circumstances to evolve their code that way. Another strategy that we have seen used successfully is having, having different pieces of, of one single pipeline 
actually publishing to PubSub using PubSub as, an, uh, as a composition point that allows you to isolate pieces of, uh, of the pipeline that you want to evolve, or perhaps adding alternative branches uh, that, that start to pick up data after a particular point and then shutting down other pieces. So that is a strategy to cope uh, and deal with breaking changes. Okay, thank you. Okay. I have a question about the lateness. Um, about what, I'm sorry? Lateness. Lateness. So data that is out of the window. Mm -hmm. After the window, after the data in the window has been, you know, gotten and accumulated, if something shows up out of bounds, I understand the default behavior is to discard that, even Correct. with the lateness uh, parameter set. Is that true? Correct, yes. So um, in, the, in the Beam SDK, how would I actually uh, ensure that, first of all, how would I ensure that that data gets handled? And secondly, does Beam actually go and pull down the raw data that was used to do you know, like the raw data from the original window? Uh, so the, um, so the, to answer your first question, there is a trigger in Beam that specifically allows you to trigger processing based on that late data. So, you know, you do after watermark to trigger something based on the watermark, and then you would do um, after, uh, with, uh, with allowed lateness to, to, uh, to add the possible lateness uh, parameter there. Um, as far as, uh, I'm not sure I understand your second question about uh, whether it, pulls down the data. Oh, you mean, does it sh deliver the data, the full data for the original window with your late data? Well, does it, does it do reprocessing, I guess, is what I'm trying uh, to say. So that's, um, that's a question of whether you use accumulating or discarding panes, if I uh, remember correctly. So with accumulating panes, every triggering is going to deliver the full contents of the window, whether it's on time or late. With discarding panes, it's, o it's only going to deliver the delta based off of the most, uh, most recent triggering execution. Okay. I'm does, uh, does that answer not, your question? Not really. So the discard actually just discards all, all raw data? So discarding, discarding what it means is every time the trigger fires, we mm -hmm. deliver the delta. We deliver the delta since the last triggering firing. So if you had two triggers, one triggering at the watermark and the second triggering off the late data, with discarding panes, you would first deliver the contents of the window at the watermark and then deliver just the late data element since that's your only delta. Okay. Uh, with accumulating panes, every time the trigger fires, you would deliver the entire contents of the window, the accumulated contents. So at the watermark, it will be whatever's there. Uh, and w at the late data uh, triggering, you would deliver the, the previous contents plus the late data element. So whether you use accumulating or discarding panes is a function of what kind of reprocessing you want to do on that data. So if you only care about the, the late element, you probably want to use discarding panes. If you want to reprocess the whole contents of the window, you need accumulating panes. And so is there a, is there a time limit on how far back I can set late? Um, in practice, yes, uh, but not at the SDK level. So in practice, how long you keep your data around is a function of how much money you're willing to pay for storage, right? And how much latency the pipeline is able to cope with before, it, you know, before it's no longer able to cope with it, right? So the, as far as I know, the SDK doesn't enforce any you know, programmatic limit on it, but you know, if, you, if you put a year there and you're, you're keeping, you keep throwing the data into year-long windows, at some point things are gonna start to break. Yeah, and there are practical ways for you to evaluate and experiment how much uh, data you're, you're willing to hold on or how much lateness you're willing to tolerate. The key thing to pay attention to is at what point with the resources that you have provisioned at max, uh, do you actually start to back up uh, in processing and you're not able to, to keep up anymore? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can establish a bound, a practical bound, based on the characteristics of your data and your typical computations so by experiment. Even though the window triggers fired, processing won't happen until, uh, I'll, I'll catch up offline. I just try Yeah, happy to. Thank yeah. You. Let's go over here. Hi. Uh, so I am occasionally asked to uh, have parameters that I can configure on my pipeline uh, while it's running without necessarily having to do an upgrade. Is there a good way to manage like runtime configurable parameters? There's a couple of different answers to that question. So one of the answers is that your pipeline is always able to read data from uh, side inputs either generated by the pipeline itself or from some other config store. So, so if you were to do that within Dataflow land, you could always emit a side, in, a side output that then is consumed as a side input somewhere. Um, and that side input would essentially be a small you can think of it as a, as a join of your data stream with a small, uh, not frequently mutated data set. So that not frequently muted data set could be your configuration that, you know, if something were to update there, then you might change how you're doing your processing. Okay. Yeah, this will not allow you, however, to change things such as the length of the windows on the fly. Sure. Like these are parameters of your own code. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Let's go back here. Uh, 
Just a quick question. Um, for the watermark, mm -hmm. is it possible to tune it or to uh, tweak it? To yeah, are there any tools around that? So the answer currently is no. So the watermark. So what we do when we uh, try and establish the watermark is we basically take everything we know about the source. We try and model the source. We try and keep track of all the data there. And once we get the data from the source, we then perfectly track the rest of the messages throughout the system. So the goal of the watermark is to be as uh, complete as possible when tracking the data. Um, so there's no there's no tunable parameters there. Um, so, uh, can you tell? Can you say more about what it is that you're trying to do with it? So, I'm concerned. So, it may work in certain applications, but it may not work everywhere, mm -hmm. right? So, does it learn from your data? Uh, is there a way for it to gather metrics for a window of time and then set the parameters, or are those fixed? So, so I'm not sure I follow. I think. What I hear you say is, is two things. One is your uh, talks about the windowing strategy, and the other one is whether you can control the passage of time by basically saying when the watermark should advance. So if you're interested in the second one, there are techniques and things that we'll be happy to talk to you about uh, that, that involve triggering okay. and different things that you can do. Uh, the watermark, as Lava said, is a function of what the service knows about the data source, That's our ability to examine, you know, your allowed lateness that you specify, plus what we're seeing in terms of arrival and guarantees on the source, and then we know when it is safe to canonically advance time. And let me say one more thing. Um, basically, if it is a custom source that you're talking about, if it's a source that you wrote and you know best about, then you can provide the watermark for the service to use. So you okay. sort of provide the watermark for a custom source, and then we use that, combine that with the watermarks throughout the rest of the pipeline. Yes. Uh, so obviously, if you know best about what kind of timestamps your source is providing, you're the best source for the information on the watermark there as well. One final strategy that I would mention, again, application dependent. Everything we've described deals with logical time, which means every data event has time, and that time has meaning, and that's what, uh, what triggers the, yes. the watermark advancement. Yes, yes. There's also real time, right? Like where, where the time advancement is a function of actual arrival. Uh, so where, where time is not part of your data, but is really a system function, there are other things that you can do there too. So does the watermark take into account both of those? No. The, well, or just the first so there's the, uh, the, the deeper answer to that question is yes, because we actually have two kinds of watermark. But when we say watermark, we really talk about the data watermark, which is a watermark on the event time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the presentation. So. Uh, it was pretty uh, interesting to see um, sessions mm -hmm. as you know, kind of one of the time windowing strategies. So I would like to ask if sessions and streaming, I mean, with streaming data is possible, and whether there are some efficiency glitches that we should be cognizant of. So uh, the first question is whether sessions and streaming is possible. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's built into the Dataflow SDK. You can use it right now. Yeah. Yep. Um, as far as efficiency glitches, I mean, I. I think it works as intended. I, I, I guess I'd have to ask more about what. I mean, event time versus you know, kind of real time kind of slips and stuff. I mean, when it comes to sessions, because it is something you know that triggers by right. itself. I mean, every message. Well, so I mean, sessions by definition is going to have latency in it, right? Because session windows are bounded by periods of inactivity. So you won't be able to know that a session has ended until you've yep. observed some time of nothing. Right. So there is an inherent latency built into the definition of session. And the trade-off for the system to be able to compute sessions is going to be space and resources, yeah. right? So, so that's really what's, what's going on there. If, if you have very choppy data and a very challenging sessioning strategy, Likely, the effect is you'll need more uh, intermediate state. Yeah, uh, I mean, which is the case. Uh, apparently, I mean, I'm coming from the advertising industry. I mean, we definitely, I mean, have we have to you know kind of silo people in sessions. I mean, in order to do our you know kind of micro scale aggregations. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right. One more question over here. My question is that uh, what is, what languages does the SDK currently support? Sure, the SDK is available in, uh, in Java and in Python. In Python, um, there are availability, uh, streaming Python is, uh, sorry, Python supports batch in, in Dataflow. Uh, if you go to the Apache Beam website, they have a Python SDK and a Java SDK already, and you'll be able to hear more about those tomorrow. But those are the two languages that, it, that, that have implemented. There are also 
third-party implementations, uh, part of this community that you'll hear more about that have produced a Scala uh, implementation of this called Shio. It's, it's built by Spotify, and others are starting to, to be discussed in the community. Great. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. Enjoy your festivities. Thank you.